is, of course, our first worship service together this year, 2016. And as people so often do, we start New Year's off with new things. And so we're, we're doing something a little different here in the, the sermon today. But um, so many of us, this time of year, we sit back and we reflect on our lives and we look at things, and we, and we all often we come up with this list of resolutions. How many people have, have written out their list of, of New Year resolutions? Uh, I want to share with you my, my secret to that. Uh, the, the, the secret to that. They always tell you that you need to write down your your resolutions, you know, and have your, your goals and write them out. I find that if you, if you write them uh, on a good sturdy paper. And if you make sure that you, that, you, that you write the date in pencil, be sure you can erase that and change the date. <laughs> and also, if, you're, if, you're, if your goal is to lose so many pounds that year, write that in pencil too so you can erase that and you know, add two or three or four or five or whatever pounds to that for the next year. So that, that's in jest. But, but so often we, we write these, these lists of resolutions and, and they get no farther than that. Um, but let's make sure that. that to have each of us corporately in our hearts of the resolution for 2016 as to have a, a better and closer and nearer relationship uh, with, with, with our, our Lord and Savior as well as with each other. So that's a serious for a resolution. Um, what we're going to do today, we're going to, we're going to go through, and, and I have not done with you yet, a sermon, a sermon series. So today I'm launching a, a sermon series, and you'll see on the front of the bullet, it's James Part 1. Now I'm not sure how many parts it's going to be, because I'm not sure how many Sundays it's going to take me to get through the book of James. I'm not in any particular hurry. We'll take it as it, as it needs to be done. Now I, I do want to dispel one rumor. Uh, the book of James is not written by, by, by Jim Bruce. Okay. Uh, though we, 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 we are having this in the month of his birthday. That's just coincidence that I decided to preach from James. It, it's not, you know, some, some recognition of James' authorship of, of James there. Uh, I found pretty good authority that, that, when, that when this book was written, Jim was in Iowa and not over somewhere in, in or around Jerusalem or, or Bethlehem or anywhere like that. So, with that, um, the book of James is a, is a very, very interesting book. I suspect that at least for some of you, it's, it's, a, it's a book that you that you favor a great deal. Uh, I know my wife, Dale, it's one of her favorite books in the entire scripture. Uh, for me as well, it's one of my favorite books. Though I will tell you right off that, that I'm certain that we each favor the book for somewhat different reasons, that we come to, come to it for different reasons that we like it. Uh, but it's a wonderful, wonderful book. Uh, as far as the authorship of the book of James, um, I'll, I'm going to back up on that and go first to the location of the canon. Uh, it's located, as you may know, right after Hebrews. It's the first book in what is generally called the Catholic epistles or the, or the general letters. Uh, here we use the word Catholic for universal. These are letters that are not written to a specific uh, church necessarily, or maybe they don't know who they're written to, uh, but James looks to be a letter that was written, that was, that was probably circulated among many different congregations, not written to just one place. It's not addressing, you know, necessarily some one issue. It's more of a, of a, of a, it's a, it's a, a, a praising, a oratory letter. It's, it's, it's praising God, and as well as it's spelling out a lot of ethics and morals and things like that. It's not a heavy theological book. Um, but as far as the author of the book, now I'll get back to that. There are several James, of course, in Scripture. Uh, but for one reason or another, and I won't get into that because of, for time, but it really boils down to that there's two options for who wrote James. One, that it was written by James the Just, the brother of Christ. The other, that it was written by somebody writing it in the name of James. James the just brother of Christ. So it's either James or somebody who's pretending to be, to be James. Uh, early on, it, 
it, it, it didn't have the easiest route to get it into cannon. Uh, there were some detractors early on, as well as supporters uh, of the letter. One of the main reasons that it, that it got its way into scripture is by the, the, the force of Origen, uh, who was a first and second century uh, theologian, well, second, excuse me, he was born around 184, so he'll be second and third, he died in the third century. Um, theologian, Origen believed that it was, in fact, written by James, the brother of Christ, and he was one of its biggest proponents. Uh, and so, partially due to Origen's influence, as well as other supporters, it did find its way into the canon. It's had a rocky go of it because if you remember when Martin Luther came in with the Reformation, Martin Luther did not like the book of James. He called it the Gospel of Straw, in fact, uh, or the Letter of Straw, depending on who's, who's writing and reading. Uh, that book, along with uh, Revelation, he wanted to remove from the canon. Uh, Clitter had prevailed, however, and they remained. In the Protestant camp, of course, it wouldn't be the, the, the uh, Catholic camp at all. But uh, as to who wrote it, well, I have my own personal opinions, as I do with most things. My wife will tell you that I have my opinions, and I tend to think that, you know, I'm, I'm always right, but that's not really true. I like to think that I'm open minded about things. But the letter itself doesn't address. Uh, some of the things that people would say, well, James would have written about. Uh, it doesn't address the issue of circumcision that he was battling with Paul about. You know, there, there's pretty good evidence in Scripture that Paul and James had a contentious relationship, but they didn't necessarily agree on, on some things, specifically about circumcision. Well, there's no mention of circumcision in this letter, and some discount it for that reason. My, my personal opinion is it doesn't address circumcision because this letter, in my mind, is probably written before the Jerusalem Council. Before that had really become an issue. It appears it was written after Paul's discipleship had begun because it does talk about faith versus works, doesn't it? Well, I'm going to put that on the back shelf and we'll talk about that when we get to that part in the scripture. But I don't, I discount that somewhat. And I say, yes, but there's a reason for that. We're, we're talking about that uh, and not talking about the circumcision. Uh, my own personal opinion is that this letter is written by, by James. I think this is James, the brother of Christ, the brother of Christ. I think this letter is very possibly the earliest letter, earliest writing that we have in it. Because I think it was written before the Jerusalem Council. And if it was written before the Jerusalem Council, then it's written before any of the letters of Paul to the Catholic Which would make it one of possibly two books that would be in contention to be the earlier book. We'll talk about the other book another day. Um, but anyway, because of that, I think James is a very, very important book. If it's written by James, the brother of Christ himself, then it, this is probably as closely as we can get to believing and to, to seeing the mind of Christ himself. Because this is written then by a man that probably knew Christ better than anyone else that we have writing in the New Testament. His brother grew up with him. Now there's some debate. Some say James would have been an older brother. James would have been a younger brother really hard to know. I'm more of a mind to think that James is the younger brother. We do know a lot about James, uh, or we actually I should say a lot, but we know more about James than we do about Jesus, actually. There's more non-canonical writing about James than there is about Jesus. Uh, we know what year James died. We know how he died. We know where he died. And all of that. Uh, so, but with that, it is a very good, uh, important book if, in fact, it's written by James, because it gets us into that, that, that clarity of Christ's thinking. Before things got you know, a little bit different, I, I should say, uh, it, it's 
probably really before Paul had so much influence on the, on the scripture as he did. As we know, most of the New Testament has Paul's fingerprints upon it. Paul wrote at least seven of the letters himself. Then there's six letters that would have been written under his influence. And then you've also got the fact that Mark wrote Mark. Mark's the disciple of Paul. Luke, but Luke wrote Luke and Acts. Luke's the disciple of Paul. Matthew, we don't know who wrote it. But as we were going on, Hebrews is definitely got Paul's fingerprints on it. So becomes the New Testament becomes mostly Paul. It could very well be that this is the only voice we have for James in the New Testament. The man that grew up with Jesus. So let's just dive into it a little bit. And I'm going to do what, what Scott the Breeze loves when I do, and that's kind of going through bit by bit. And we'll do that through this letter. But each week I'll give you a little bit of, of history as well about, about the book. James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives gen generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. First of all, this letter is, is very Jewish in its, in its formation. He's addressing, right off the bat, the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. He's writing this letter to the Jewish people scattered in the, what they call the diaspora, the people outside of Jerusalem. It was always in Jerusalem. And some theologians and some authors believe that James was in Jerusalem prior to Jesus starting his ministry, but we'll get into that later. Uh, but James is writing this from Jerusalem, if, it's, if it is James, the brother of Christ, and he's writing it to fellow Jews. He's not really, he's, he's writing this as a Christian document, but he's addressing it to Jews. The 12 tribes. He's telling us to consider it joy when we face trials. Wow, that's counter thinking, isn't it? How many of us, when we when we run up against a trial, some some obstacle, we go, oh, for joy! I get to have, I get to be tried today. I get to, I get to have this thing that's going to try my patience. You know, my my wife. I hope she thinks, oh, it's pure joy. I'm going to marry Roy because he's going to try my patience you know, for the remainder of my life. You know, <laughs> and I see, and I see Jody smiling there, Jeff. I mean, it's good she's smiling. <laughs> but there's a meme that was, was on Facebook that said that, that a marriage is finding that special person you want to annoy for the rest of your life. That's the one that was on that. But, but marriage can be a trial sometimes. Uh, everything in life can be a trial. But we don't believe that, that what they're not saying here, and we'll get to that later on in the scripture, it's not God that's throwing that trial in your way necessarily. But in that trial, you can find perseverance. And in that perseverance, you can build your faith because you understand that trial, that thing that's getting in my way today, that thing that's making life difficult, is pretty doggone insignificant when we compare it to what I really need to be doing or what I really need to be about and what my God is about. And what God's got in store for me, what God wants for me, what God has is going to do through me. These trials will, will fade away. I just have to get through it. Perseverance. And it will finish its work. And with, again, it, with that comes maturity. Complete. And maturity, if you're mature about something, you understand that that trial is just a bump in the road. And this too shall pass, as they say. And you get beyond it. And 
again, in the significance, the scope of what we're really all about and what God's all about, no matter what it is, it's just a minor thing. There's been an awful lot of people endured some trials that are, that are many, you know, many, many times more than anything that I've ever had to or probably ever will have to face uh, in my life. And they've gotten through it and gone on and done wonderful, great, magnificent things to honor their God. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God to give generously to all without finding fault. Um, we should all be praying for wisdom and gentleness. Because we're in those trials. Many times those trials are, are what? They're because of poor decision making on our part. We ask for the wisdom. We'll have fewer trials. If we have the perseverance, we'll get through the trial. But then he comes into this part about the double mindedness. We pray for things, don't we? We pray for God to give us the strength to get through some of these things. We pray for this or that. We pray for deliverance from this or that. But yet then sometimes we think, and, and our double-mindedness sets in. How many times can we say that we've truly been single-minded about something and never doubted? it? Boy, I, you know, I unfortunately, I can probably count the number of times that I've been able to get there honestly say, I'm 100% focused and confident that I'm going to get through these, this, this situation. Um, generally, it's actually some big thing. That's the really the irony of it. It's usually some major thing that you feel pretty confident about. Little everyday things can kind of, kind of you know, whatever. You, you, you let those get befuddled. But oftentimes, we don't exhibit the faith that we, that we really should. That or that James or is telling us here that if you're double-minded, he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed in the wind. That man should not think he would receive anything from the Lord. James is telling us to be confident. No matter what will come, it may not be what we want to come. It may not be what we, what we really think will be the best outcome. But we have to put faith in God in order to happen. God will make good on this. He'll give, even in the worst, as I've said before, even in the complete destruction of something, if we put our faith in God, God's not the one that's sort of that is really doing that, destroying of that, 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 that catastrophe. But out of that catastrophe, if we put our faith in God and we pray to Him, He'll help us to find some, some good and create something out of it, even the worst. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position, because he will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. If its blossoms fall and its beauty is destroyed, in the same way the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. Anything that we have in this world is short-lived, right? We can brag about wealth, we can brag about position, we can brag about prestige, all of these things that, that the earth would tell us that, that, that this is some great thing. This is not what it's about. This is not what the world is about. Take pride. Those in humble position circumstances take pride in this in his high position. This is not, James is not, uh, not promoting in any way that, that you should describe for, for, for riches or position or any of those things. He's looking more for a relationship. Humble. He's not necessarily besmeeching those things, but at the same time, he's just telling you that all these things that you might have to store up, they're all going to rot and rust. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. That's going back to that under trial, persevere. There's the, there's the crown. And this is the part that I want to get to, and this is probably as far as we'll, we'll go today. I don't want to, I'm actually really not watching the time. This is really kind of a, a, an ad, you know, ad hoc sermon, I guess. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. 
For God cannot be tempted. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Excuse me, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to go back to stop at 15. Gives birth to death. Temptation doesn't come from God. Temptation comes from the human heart. And I've often said, and I'm not sure I've said, mentioned it from up here, but, but I've often told people, if you want to see Satan, take a look in the mirror. He'll be looking right back at you. Because the, the evil, the ego, the temptation, those things are coming from the human heart. It's coming from the pure, that simplicity, that good wolf, that that old Indian parable that we talked about before, where each of us is good and is bad. Oftentimes, it's that people want to, to ascribe temptations to, to, to God tempting you to try to, uh, you know, to put a trial in front of you, as we are talking about the trials earlier. I don't think the trials come from God. I don't think the temptations come from God. I think the temptations come from weakness. That's what I'm in battle with. And that's what all of us are in battle with. We talk about hypocrisy in, in, in Sunday school today a little bit. Um, and, and I mentioned with my mentor Bob, and I, and, and I apologize if I tell the story too many times, but, but, but Bob, uh, one time in a study group, uh, when I was studying with him and my, my late mentor Jesse and some other guys, the fellows that are all older pastors, uh, Bob said that he said, the one advantage of getting older is sin is not as attractive as you. But that's the problem, is that sin's attractive, and it's attractive because of the human heart. It's not God that's throwing that sin out there. Well, let's see if I can do this, and we can make, we can make, you know, Floyd fall, fall away today. God's not going to do that. That's me doing that. And I have to be on watch, because I'm my own worst enemy. It's all our own. God doesn't make bad things happen to you, I don't believe. God doesn't make temptations. He doesn't try you. God's there. Lord, we lift all these prayers to you in your holy, loving, gracious.